Hello, BookTube. I'm a little late with videos. Uh, sort of will be catching up over the next day or two. Uh, this is my second video for March of the Mammoths. And I read Bleak House by Charles Dickens. This is the Penguin Edition, the newer Penguin Edition, where everything sort of wore off while I was reading it. Uh, the Black, which I don't really care for. Uh, it's... Over a thousand pages with uh, notes and appendices and introduction. And it's my second read of, of Charles uh, Dickens's Bleak House. I enjoy it thoroughly. Uh, I'll read you. I, th I think the writing is, is quite well done. And the first two paragraphs are exceptional, I think. London. Michaelmas term lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather, as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth, and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus, forty feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill. Smoke lowering down from chimney pots, making a soft black drizzle, with flakes of soot, in it as big as full-grown snowflakes, gone into mourning, one might imagine, for the death of the sun. Dogs undistinguishable in mire, horses scarcely better splashed to their very blinkers, foot passengers jostling one another's umbrellas in a general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold on street corners, where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke, if the day ever broke, adding new deposits to the crust upon crust of mud, sticking at those points tenaciously to the pavement and accumulating at compound interest. Fog everywhere, fog up the river where it flows among green eights and meadows, fog down the river where it rolls defiled among the tiers of shipping and the waterside pollutions of a great and dirty city. Fog on the Essex marshes, fog on the Kentish heights, fog creeping into the cabooses of collier brigs, fog lying out on the yards and hovering in the rigging of great ships, fog drooping on the gunnels of barges and small boats, fog in the eyes and throats of ancient Greenwich pensioners wheezing by the fireside of their wards, fog in the stem and bowl of the afternoon pipe of the wrathful skipper down in this close cabin fog cruelly pinching the toes and fingers of his shivering little apprentice boy on deck chance people on the bridge peeping over the parapets into another sky of fog with fog all around them as if they were in a, up in a balloon and hanging in the misty clouds yeah <laughs> i think that sort of sets the scene nicely and for a bleak house all around um it originally was published in 1853 but it was in book form it was preceded by 20 um i think it was weekly uh parts uh that were published in a uh, magazine it's a very sprawling book uh it is um a satire in many ways on the legal professional profession and especially uh, lawyers with their um, drawing out uh, and, and uh, proceedings. And in this case, it's a case called Jarndyce uh, versus uh, Jarndyce and Jarndyce. It's a uh, contention of wills. And this uh, we sort of hear has been going on generational uh, for a long time and it's affected people all the way through and the other cases that the chancery uh sees affects other people there there is one woman who sits daily hoping that her case will come up and she's been doing this for a long long time and there are dozens of characters in here the main character is uh well it, it's told partially by one of the main characters, Esther Summerson, 
she um, becomes a ward of a John John Di- John Dice uh, with with uh, a two others uh, that are uh, in part of the John Dice case. Uh, they're they're young. Uh, they're cousins, and the, the the three of them are cousins. And it's it's told partially through the eyes of Esther. And it's inter- interspersed with uh, a third, a third person narrator, who is sort of uh, an omniscient uh, uh, narrator. Uh, so it, it makes it a bit different. Like it, it, they don't converge; they coincide, I guess you would say, and and they continue on uh, from one another at times. Esther. Uh, is hesitant to talk about certain things. It's from her point of view. Uh, her her thoughts are very much in her narration. The third party narration is, as I say, it's more sort of uh, looking down upon, and with with thoughts, uh, internal thoughts, occasionally of the characters. And you, we got names uh, that is typically Dick uh, Dickensian. Uh, a lawyer named Talkinghorn, and there's Lady and Baron Deadlock, Lady Deadlock and Baron Deadlock, Sir Sir Lester Deadlock, Skimpole, Small Weed, uh, the name and and Crook uh, is is a guy who's a sort of a rag and bone man. And there are many deaths uh, throughout. Uh, spontaneous combustion, starvation, more or less um, illness, disfigurement by illness. It's it's how the past is ever present, also in in the uh, people's lives. How. Uh, you know things that happened in the past, sort of like the sins of the of the father or the sins of the parents are are met out on or whatever the saying is on the children, and Esther is is the result of that. Uh, but there's also duty, uh, one's duty to oneself, one's family, and to their betters, uh, and to those who help and. Sometimes their own views get subsumed and their their wishes get subsumed uh, because they have obligations to meet and do it. Not everyone does. And um, because Esther is an orphan, well, she believes she's an orphan. She believes her parents are dead. But through the course of the story, she finds out who her parentage is, especially her mother, and she meets her mother, and she finds out who her father was, and the story, and this is where reputations uh, can be, uh, are very affected uh, by scandal, and uh, like I'm not, I'm not going to spoil any of the story uh, with this, and it's, it's too sprawling to really go through, but it's it's sort of um, it's partially Esther's journey uh, through finding out who she is and finding out you know um, being helped and her obligations to the person who helps her uh, and and then her friends that she she meets um, which is Ada. Uh, which is a cousin. Uh, she's a John Dice um, descendant, as I was mentioning, and um, I forget his name now. Sorry, um, Richard. Richard. Uh, and she becomes very close friends to them, very close to Ada. Uh, they rely on each other, and she is. Is feels responsible in some ways for them as well, as well as other people she meets, friend that become friends and confidants. 
And so it's her, her, her discovery and her journey through life. But there's also, like I say, the past, how the past has, has, as affecting, um, the present. And that is the will of John Dice and John Dice, how it affects not only just, uh, Esther, but her friends, uh, the the John Dices, the three cousins, how it affects their lives uh, 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 in in completion, and and it it uh, insinuates uh, into their lives, and it's like a rot in some ways, or it can be. And then you've got um, Esther's history, as I say, of her parentage and how that affects other other um, people in this story that are affected by this and how how the secrets sort of are slowly coming to light and how that affects all these other people and how one person uses it as sort of thinking it could be control of finding out um the secret and he he pays the price uh by getting shot for uh for uh you know meddling in this stuff and wanting the power so there as i say there's deaths and all, all these myriad characters are all related and in, in, not related by by parentage or family but related in struggles in in histories that are similar or drawn together because of those divergent things that all of a sudden at the present of the book diverge that they all meet and they all care for for uh, each other uh, there's the, the as I mentioned there's this one older lady she just constantly goes to the chancery uh, into the court and hopes that her case will come up and she's got a huge uh, collection of birds uh, and even the birds are named and like Dickens goes into details of things like there's a whole section of uh, where she talks about her birds not a, not a big section but then she names all her birds and uh, yeah and it's it's uh, it's an interesting way to tell the story with the two different narrators uh, I really enjoyed it. As I say, it's it's like I don't want to give it away, but it's it's all these things. It's uh, um, I'll just read the back here what it says here. Uh, um, as the interminable case of John Dice and John Dice grinds its way through the court of Chancellery, it draws together a disparate group of people: Ada Clare and Richard Carstone, whose inheritance it gradually. Uh, is gradually being devoured by legal cost. Esther Summerson, a ward of the court, the menacing lawyer, Tulkinghorn, the determined sleuth inspector, Bucket, Inspector Bucket, and even Joe, a destitute crossing uh, sweeper, a savage indictment of the society that is ro rotten to the core. Bleak House is one of Dickens' most ambitious novels with a range that extends from the drawing rooms of aristocracy to the London slums. And that's that's a good uh, summation of it, really, uh, in just a small paragraph. And, uh, yeah, and, and this is uh, Inspector Bucket shows up um, and is an interesting character and uh, a memorable character because he's written about quite a bit. And it's been... It's been done on radio as a uh, radio play several several times the bbc tv has done uh 1950s i've got um the 1958 i think version of it it's a long version and then in the 60s they did it again uh in the 80s uh actually i think will be my favorite version uh what diana rigg uh denim elliott uh, Philip Franks, I think, is in it. He plays Richard, I believe. I'm not, uh, but I bet anyway. Diana Rigg and uh, and uh, Denham Elliott is in there. And then they redid it again uh, with uh, um, 
uh, with you know more 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 recently. I I forget who uh, who the actors were, uh, and they're all they're all interesting. And I'm going to be doing it as a book. To, uh, well, I guess it'll be book to TV uh, at some point. Uh, but I do want to watch the three ver rewatch. Well, I've never seen the 1958 version in full. So in the 1968 or the 1960s version, I think only a few episodes remained. Uh, they've been wiped. Uh, but uh, as I say, there's been lots of um, adaptations of this. And there was also a more recent adaptation. Uh, I think it was called Dickensian, which it was a mishmash of a whole bunch of characters from Dickens' books. And Inspector Bucket is is investigating uh I, th I believe esther summerson is in there as well uh but a whole bunch of characters uh from from a whole bunch of books uh um mrs uh favisham from great expectations uh oliver uh oliver twist is in there um scrooge marley uh it just it just goes on and on and on for for characters uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the descriptions of places is really good as well. Uh, he, he goes into a lot of detail for describing the streets. And as you can see from the first two paragraphs, it, the scene and atmosphere is set very, very well by those two opening, opening paragraphs, because it, it, it's, it, it's, it's, all this sort of filth and rot is is all the way through the book in either people or you know setting or happenstance it's it's there and greed everything anyway um that's enough for that um i will be back next week with i am be starting middle march so that's my next book for march of the mammoths and i will see you next time book two